Hey, Mr. Pond Balls, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Lusk. It must be Wednesday. Going live. I see Drew Schmidt checking in already. Good to see you guys. Good to see what there. Let's see who else we got. We got four people going coming up. Good to see everybody. Uh, it kind of got hot over here today, but I wasn't involved in a whole lot of that. The uh, I had a pretty whirlwind last few days. I'll tell you a little bit about that. But I think tonight I'm gonna start talking a little bit. Of course, we lost Ray Scott, and I told you a Ray Scott story last week. I want to tell you another one. <laughs> I was pretty fortunate to be able to spend time with him. Hey, Stephen Stupa, Rick McGuire, Linda Welsh, Billy Bates, checking in from Maryland. And you, Billy, Billy Bates got it. Hey, hi, Kenny. Kenny's checking in from Kansas. Billy Bates, Maryland. Kim Moore, checking in from Illinois. There's Wyatt, checking in from Denver, Colorado. Good to see everybody. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like or that little heart thing, that little red heart thing you're right down there. Click on that. Share this to your timeline and you are eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat and something else cool, like a Pond Boss shirt or whatever Leanne's got, which may be a book, I don't know. She had, I didn't talk to her today about this stuff. So, hey, Danny Mac, good to see you, buddy. Cheers to Danny Mac. John Dyer says it's a bit warm on that side of the fence. Hello, Fred Bingaman from Illinois. Good to see you guys. So I was going to, uh, I've got a lot of Ray Scott stories. I was very fortunate and blessed to be able to spend a fair amount of time with him starting around 1998, 99, through there somewhere. Hello, James Allen, Jim Allen, checking in from over Kentucky, Kentucky way. Um, and one, one thing that happened one time is after one of the Pond Boss conferences, a guy that attended there from Georgia, he wanted, he wanted Ray and I to go look at his lake in Georgia, South Central Georgia. And the mission was he was trying to enlarge an existing lake and make it a better fishing lake. So my, my job was to help make it a better fishery. And he wanted Ray to put his thumbprint on it, you know, from a construction side on building structure. Because at that point, Ray was doing some consulting work on, on building lakes and doing the fish habitat in it. Well, after we toured the guy's place, he decided to take us to lunch at a local cafe, which we did, great fun. And then as we came out the door to the right, there was a beauty parlor there. And the guy just, you know, Ray, Ray's a megastar in that industry. And he and, and he wanted to go, our, our host wanted to go share, show Ray off because he saw some people he knew in the beauty shop. <laughs> so we went in the beauty shop and Ray always sized up the crowd, always. And he opened the door and he looked and he started looking and there were several really beautiful women and and they were beautiful but they they looked like they were having a hard life you know, if that makes sense you know i mean stunning stunning beauty and one of them husband was with her so ray turns and he looks at me and says hey you got a quarter and i said yeah and i reached in my pocket and i gave him a quarter and so he said what's this <laughs> So he goes in and he takes his hat off and he's being the Southern gentleman and talking to everybody. And you know, these ladies don't really know who he is, but the husband is gushing. And he said, oh my gosh, that's Ray Scott, the guy that started BASS, Bassmasters Fishing Tournaments, Bassmasters Classic. That's the guy, he is super famous. And so Ray strikes up a conversation with him and then he's got my quarter in his hand. He turns around and looks at this guy's wife and he holds that quarter up. He says, honey, I bet you I can kiss you on your cheek so softly that you can't feel it. And she blushed. And he, she said, what? He said, honey, I bet you a quarter. I can kiss you so softly on your cheek that you can't feel it. And she looked at her husband. He said, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so she said, okay. And here's all these. There's probably six women, the, the beauty technicians and this woman's husband. Ray reaches over, gives her a big old wet, mushy kiss on the cheek, pushes her head to the side with his lips, and he says, did you feel it? She says, well, yeah. He said, well, here's your quarter. <laughs> and it was my quarter. <laughs> whenever uh, whenever I, I met Ray and started running around with him, one of my uh, early longtime great customers was a guy named Ray Mursky. Well, he knew 
Ray Scott. He fished in his first tournament. Matter of fact, Mursky was able to secure the last 10 anglers of the very first All-American Bass Fishing Tournament where Ray Scott could make a profit with his first tournament. Well, Mursky told me, he said, hey, I hear you've been hanging around with Scott. He called everybody Buck. Hey, Buck, I heard you've been hanging around with Scott. I said, yes, yes, sir, I have. And I'm, I'm kind of enamored with him because I just love the way that he is. He said, well, he's, he plays a game, and don't let him play it with you. I said, okay, well, what's the game? He said, he likes to take money from your pocket and put it into his pocket and make both of you like it. And I watched that man do that over and over and over, and he got my quarter that day, and I liked it. So so there's a Ray Story Scott for you. I mean, Ray Scott story for you there. Let's see here. Who else we got? Steve Thorburn from Kansas. Mike Cook checking in from uh, up in North Carolina. Billy Bates, Maryland, currently trying to entice a big snakehead to bite a frog that I can see guarding a fry ball near my pier. Hey, see if you can scoop out that fry ball of snakeheads and send them to snakehead, snakehead Haven. There's Howard Dittrick from uh, hanging out in Florida. Todd Austin, good to see you. Troy Seal, what we got there? Look at there, Trey Carpenter, long time no see. I, part of what I'm going to talk about tonight is is I got to spend time with Trey yesterday and this morning, and that that was pretty cool. I did a a, a real whirlwind run, and Trey, I'm going to talk about some of the stuff that we discussed. To the wee hours of the night last night. So what happened was Trey texted me and said, hey, I'm going to get to go fish a lake up in North Texas that you've managed before. So I texted him back and said, where is it? And he said, I don't know. I'm going with Steve Knight. Well, Steve Knight's an outdoor rider and he, Steve and I have run parallel courses for probably 35 or 40 years and we knew it, but we'd never met. Now I talked to him on the phone once or twice for an interview, I think, but he lives in Tyler. He's, I think he's probably the last newspaper outdoor writer that I know of. He's the only one in Texas that I know of. All the rest of them are gone. You know, either moved on, passed on, or got fired, which I don't know, you know, and, but Steve is still at it and doing it. Well, so uh, it just so happened that I needed to run over west of Hope, Arkansas, east of Texarkana, and look at an, ox, an Oxbow Lake site that this guy's drained and he wants to make it bigger. So I, I just came back to, to Trey and I said, hey, Trey, you know what? I might be able to swing by if you guys have time. So on Monday, I hooked it up to my office in Gordonville, Texas. We have eight hatchery ponds with bluegill. I'm going to try to harvest some bluegill over the weekend if I can get it done. Um, and I needed to mow around those ponds so we could access them with the truck, trailer, sains, and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, yesterday, about, oh, I think around 11 o'clock, I finished mowing, cleaned up, and I headed over to Texarkana. And spent a couple hours looking at that site, and then I hoofed it over there and met up with Trey and Steve, and they were fishing a lake called Flag Lake at Graff Ranch. So after they were fishing, I had stopped and picked up some Mexican food at a place, and we, we all broke bread, ate, you know, ate fajitas, and, and just got to know each other a little bit. I'd spent a little time with Trey, and Trey and I have talked on the phone a lot. And so, after we got through talking, uh, they started asking questions and we started sharing stories after supper. And come to find out, we've all been on some of the same properties with different reasons. You know, Steve, to write about it, Trey is a retired wildlife biologist who retired in his 50s, actually maybe his late 40s, I don't know, Trey, you might want to tell him. Um, and so we started sharing some of our expenses and all my, I mean, experiences. And so, holy cow, we ended up talking, share a little wine, share a little food. Now, Trey didn't drink any wine. Steve and I did. He and I drank a bottle together. Wasn't that big a deal. It was good wine. <laughs> and then we shared uh, places we've been, things we've seen. And before we knew it, it was midnight last night. So we said, you know, it's, we probably ought to go to bed because those guys were going to get up at 6 o'clock and go fishing. And, and I had to climb in my truck this morning and drive five and a half hours to Brownwood, Texas to help a good friend of mine that's, that's been a client in the past to help him put some fluoridone in the lake. Howard, fluoridone in the copper can be a way to get a bloom in a clear lake. Yeah, well, what the fluoridone does is it killed the vegetation, copper killed the algae, and... It created, it released the nutrients, and, and Howard got a, a spectacular bloom. Well, I'm hoping the same thing happens over in Brownwood. So 
Uh, anyway, that lake over there has got a lot of milfoil, but an amazing amount of coontail, and it's probably 40% covered. So we put three gallons of Floridone in about a 20-acre lake, and you guys look that price up, and I'll give you sticker shock. So that the same thing can happen in that lake that's happened in Dr. Dittrich's lake. Look at there, Christopher Aguilar, and I see Josie checking in. She likes that story. So anyway, on last night, we... We, we just made the conscious decision. It's time to go to bed, boys. It's midnight. You guys are going to get up at 6, make a little chorizo egg tortilla breakfast, and then you guys are going to go hit the water, and I'm going to hit the road. So we climbed in bed, and we kept telling stories, and I felt like a... I, <laughs> Josie, you'll like this. I felt like a 7th grade girl at a sleepover, at a slumber party. And we talked, and at 1.30, I said, boys, it's 1.30. And... Trey said, oh my gosh, it's 1.30? I said, yeah. He said, well, we probably go to, go to sleep. So we told stories for about another 30 minutes, and then we conked out, and 6 o'clock came pretty early. So it was uh, pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Yeah, Howard, three gallons, you know, $2,300 a gallon. But what's going to happen with the lake we treated today, it's the Floridone is going to take it probably 60 days to do its due, and what fluoridone does is it stops the plant, the target species' ability to photosynthesize, effectively causing it to starve to death. So that's what we did today. But last last night, one of the questions that popped up was as we were talking, it's we were talking about how long a bass's memory lasts. Well, with some empirical studies. Scientists have proven that a bass's memory lasts about 15 minutes. Well, if you take that, and I believe that. I totally believe a bass's memory lasts 15 minutes. And I believe that because of the pieces of their brain that they have and the pieces of the, the, their brain that they're missing. So they don't have any cognitive ability. They don't have recall. You know, they don't have the ability to deduce what they have is instinct and conditioning. So if they if they go eat a bluegill and they're rewarded with a meal, then they can get conditioned to do that again and again and again. But that doesn't mean they remember eating a bluegill 15 minutes later. So the same thing when you're fishing. A, a bass's memory doesn't last but 15 minutes which is why you can throw a bait and, and, and hook up, lose the fish, and then turn around and catch it in just a, in a few minutes. Uh, one of my longtime friends and former client, Doug Jackson from Button Willow Club over in Lone Oak, Arkansas, he sent me a picture one time where he had cast a lure, a topwater bait, a Zara spook or something, and he'd retrieved it, brought it into the side of the boat, and his phone rang. So he answered his phone, and a bass hit that spook and took off. Jerked his rod in the water. Disappeared. He couldn't get it. Well, he just kept, he got another rod and kept fishing. And half an hour later, he catches a bass that's got a lot of drag on it. And yes, you guessed it. He caught that bass that had the czar spook in its side of its mouth, and he got his rod back, got his lure back, got the fish back on another bait. So... That's one of those memory things. But here's what I want to explain about this. Yeah, Doug Cusick. Hello, boss. Trey Carpenter. I was 51. 51 win. <laughs> yeah, all right. So the difference between memory and conditioning in a fish is a fish a bass especially can't remember anything. But what it can do is become conditioned. Like when, when, I mean, how many times have you heard the stories or you've seen this where you drive up to a pond and you see all the swirls coming and the farmer gets out with a Folgers coffee can full of fish feed, walks out on his dock, stomps his feed three times, throws the feed in the water and the catfish boil up and they eat it. They're conditioned to that. Bass are conditioned to their environment, they're conditioned to that water chemistry, and they're conditioned to their uh, habitat, food chain. They're, they become conditioned to that. And their behavior 
to some extent reflects that conditioning. Now, one of the things that uh, one of the some, some, I've had people ask me, what are the most important tools that I need to manage my pond? You know, oxygen meters. I think somebody asked this on the show two or three weeks ago. I think the number one thing you need is is a thermometer, an, an accurate thermometer, so you can see what the temperature of the water is. Now, where do you measure the temperature? Just decide where you want to measure it. Do it that way every time. 18 inches under the surface. That's great. And, and just check the temperature. The second thing you need is a SETCHI disc. Now, if you need an oxygen meter and you check the oxygen levels, or if you think you need one, and you check the oxygen levels and the, temp- and the oxygen levels are lower lethal, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. But if you've got a thermometer and you've got a SETCHI disc and you're measuring visibility and you're measuring temperature, those two things are related. Almost everything biological that happens with your pond is triggered by temperature. Now, there's other factors that come into play, you know, like food and like um, sunlight penetration for plants, that kind of stuff. Yes, that plays a role, but everything spawning is triggered by temperature. The way that bass behave is triggered by temperature. Uh, the place that the places that fish go is triggered by temperature because these animals are cold-blooded, which means that they have to seek their, their prime temperature in order to function at peak capacity. Now, coming up in the next issue of Pond Boss, which I was pretty livid yesterday when Leanne called me and said the May-June issue has not even been printed yet, and it's been at the printer since April 23, and it should have been in the mail stream by April 28. They say they're going to print it Monday or Tuesday and get it in the mail stream. I'm furious about that. But you know what? They've got supply chain issues with paper, and they've got labor issues. So it fits the whole mold of what's going on in the whole United States. But back to the fish and the ponds. So look at temperature and look at visibility. The, the less visibility that you have in, a, in your pond, the higher the risk is that something bad can happen as the temperature goes up. So those are the two things you need. So now going back to the conditioning, Bass and bluegill and catfish and crawfish, everything that's an animal that lives in the water becomes conditioned to that environment. And here's where it becomes pretty important. You know, we had a little debate last night. It wasn't a debate. It was just a friendly little chit-chat where we were talking about catching fish from that lake and moving them to this lake. So as Steve and Trey and I were talking, it was, hey, uh, Trey had caught a 27-inch bass that weighed four pounds. And the conclusion was that that, the landowner where he caught that fish had caught that fish from a public reservoir by legal means, transported it, put it into its, in his lake. And in order for that fish to have grown to 27 inches, it had to weigh something north of eight pounds, probably closer to 11 or 12 at its peak. It's a female. So taking that fish from the habitat where it had become conditioned and had lived eight or 10 years or however old it was and moving it into a new environment, no matter how pristine, how happy the water was, how great the food chain is, that fish was conditioned to that environment and the odds of it conditioning to this environment is low. It's a percentage game, okay? So if you take 100 bass, 25 or 30 of them are going to figure out how to make a living in the new environment and thrive in it. Another 20, 25 can be average or a little above average. The rest of them are going to either stay status quo or they're going to deteriorate and die. Okay, so Steve said, well, what about genetics? Sure, that play that can play a role. You can take an 11, 12-pound bass from that environment, if you do it in February, Move it into your environment to breed with your existing bass in a lake that's been stocked at least five years, so it's maturing. And if you take that big bass and move it in there so some of your bass can spawn with it because you'd like to have its genetics, yeah, you can do that. But don't expect that fish to perform and grow larger. It isn't, isn't likely to do that. And that's because of conditioning. So the difference between memory and conditioning is this. Memory is what that fish can get for 15 minutes and respond to versus what it gets with Pavlov's dogs every single day. 
that tree is going to be in the same place. Those bluegill are going to be hanging out over by that beaver lodge. The water currents are going to be flowing in through the spring, you know, coming up from the bottom of the pond, what, whatever it is. Those fish become conditioned to that. Now, one of the part of the talk we were talking about was so, so, Bob, you think that a certain percentage of these fish are going to adjust to that habitat? I absolutely believe that. So let's take, I think the example I use, well, let's take, let's take a female largemouth bass and she lays 100,000 eggs. And the goal we have set for that pond is we want to grow double digit bass as fast as we can. Well, out of those 100,000 eggs, you can throw 50,000 of them in the trash because they're boys. Oh, but wait, some of those are going to survive. You know, and out of that other 50,000 that are girls, about 30% of those, 15,000 of them is going to have the genetic propensity. They're going to have the aggressive nature where they can uh, adjust and condition to that environment and that's called plasticity in biology, you know, if they get the opportunity. Now, what are the odds of 15,000 bass out of 100,000 bass that are spawned, that's total of 15%, what are the odds that those, that those fish are gonna survive long enough to see that double digit status? I'm gonna tell you that it's one in a million odds because chances are that those fish are gonna get eaten. Now out of that whole 100,000, the whole mission of nature is for the mommy and the daddy bass to replace themselves. So if you do that math, that's two fish. That's two fish. What are the odds of the 15,000 providing those two fish? One in 20 million. I mean, I'm not a statistician, but that's, that's the number I'm gonna pick which means that you and I are more likely to be struck by lightning because that's a one in a one in 17 million risk than a spawn of bass have of producing that singular 12, 13, 14 pound largemouth bass. Now, one way you can do it though is with the new lake syndrome. Your odds go way, way, way up if you stock a lake properly in the beginning. Uh, I got a, I got a, 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 a Pond, not a, uh, come on, uh, Facebook message. <laughs> I, I taught a seminar last week over east of Rockwall, Texas. And one of the guys that was going to attend that meeting sent me a message. And he built a pond and he had put in some bluegills, some fathead minnows, some bass minnows, which were golden shiners, and some black salties. Now, black salties are dark colored goldfish that have been developed, developed to be marketed for fish bait primarily along the Gulf Coast to catch redfish and you know speckled trout and, and saltwater fish. However, they also market them to be used as fish bait. Well, this guy's kind of bought into the, to the, to the premise that these black salties could be a good source of food for when he stocked his bass. So in his question, he said, I've stocked, I've stocked fathead minnows, I've stocked bass minnows, golden shiners, he said, I stocked uh, bluegills and red ear sunfish, and I caught and put in four bass. And it's like a two acre pond or something. So I, I like to be, yeah, Howard says there's a Bucky's east of Rockwall. <laughs> yeah, there's, hey, Bucky's are popping up everywhere. You've even got some over in Florida. Hello, Tom Davis from Ohio, Michael Eric, Iowa. Let's see here. I'm, I'm going to circle back to, to that analogy if I remember what I was talking about. Hey, there's Elena Brinkman checking in. Good to see her. Howard, are all kinds of turtles bad for fish beds and eating? No, not all kinds are. And actually, you know, red air sliders, mud turtles, they do like to disrupt spawning. But if there's enough fish spawning, then recruitment can still be pretty high. And Howard, in your lake, I mean, one of your issues is you need to be removing bass. Okay, uh, Patrick Clayton, 70 degrees in the Brazos this afternoon. Man, I just... I made a whirlwind run. I just got here, and I'm going to be working on working on um, pond boss all day tomorrow, pretty much. James Allen used using a cut open Purina largemouth bag as a tablecloth out near the lake. Works great, and that guy's photo scares the bugs away. Yeah, I can imagine that would be the case. All right, let's see here. Let's go back here. Let me see. So, what was I talking about? Oh, oh, the guy over near Rockwall. So, 
I messaged him. I answered his question, and I was trying to be as diplomatic as possible. So I said, what you did is 180 degrees opposite of what we recommend. Here's what we recommend. Build the food chain first. Stock small bass so they can grow up in that environment. Now, if you want to stock some bigger bass, let's discuss it. So I asked him when he stocked those four bass, it was right in the middle of the spawn. So if one of those bass is a boy and the other three are girls, then he's going to get some pretty big spawns. And when those spawns occur, then he's going to be overcrowded with little bitty bass coming up the pipe because he's only got four large predators that are wearing out his food chain already. So I got a message from him yesterday as I was traveling. I took a look at it. And he, he had a, a dip net where he'd captured a fish and he had his hand under the, the net net and he, he said, is this a golden shiner? And I looked at it and it was a little baby goldfish. So his black salties had reproduced. So now in that pond that doesn't have enough predators, as he's building his food chain, goldfish have reproduced. Black salties are goldfish and they're bred to be black, but when they breed, it's, it's like it's like a black baldy calf crossed between a Hereford and an Angus. When that black baldy reproduces, what do you get? You're going to have some calves with red, some black, some Hereford looking, some Angus looking, some with white faces, some without. So he's going to get a mix of different kinds of goldfish that are mostly kind of a uh, bronze color. Well, if he had enough bass, he could keep their numbers in check. But here's the problem. By stocking those black salties, they can get to be two pounds a piece, root around in the bottom of this pond and keep it muddy. So it's pretty smart to do a little bit more homework before you make those kinds of decisions. I see Steve Lewis checking in. Steve's over there in Hot Springs, Arkansas. John Pearson, Dwight Lee, Kirk Swallow from Louisiana. Yep. So uh, you guys bring some questions to me. I do, I do want to tell you a little bit about what happened uh, I went and looked at this Oxbow Lake, northeast of Texarkana, Arkansas, west of Hope, Arkansas, probably 10 miles northeast of Texarkana, 20 miles or so west, northwest of Hope, Arkansas. Now, the Red River runs right through there. The Red River is a good portion of the northern boundary of Texas, and then it cuts through and goes east and then cuts south right just before Hope, Arkansas. So this is a, a hunting ranch that a fellow bought several years ago. And there's an oxbow lake, shaped like a crescent moon. So he, he knew it was real shallow, full of American lotus. He wanted to make it a good bass fishing lake. But what he thought was, you know what? This is a hunting ranch. So he took that oxbow lake, drained it, pumped it empty, built a levee right in the middle of it. And on the northwest side of the levee of that side of the crescent moon is all shallow water, where he's doing some plantings so, he, so he can attract the waterfowl for hunters. Then on the other side, he wants to take that area and turn it into a great fishing lake. Well, here's the problem. With oxbow lakes, the soils are layered over eons. So it may be choked full of silt. It might be a, a layer of clay six or seven feet deep. Then it might be a layer of sand or gravel. So he started digging around in it and he figured out that it, about 12 feet below the surface of the bottom of the lake, which is only three or four feet deep, he started hitting sand. So he had the dozer, or the, the track coat guy, pack the hole back full and he's made, the mind, made his mind not to go any deeper than about six or seven feet, see if he can raise the water level about two feet so he can get to depth. So he was asking me, what do I need to do? Um... Colin Owens, I see how many pounds of fish breaker. I'll come to that here in a minute. We'll talk about that. That's a good question. Uh, and so what he wanted to do was raise the water level a couple of feet. Well, and if he does that, it's going to shove the water way back up on just a gentle slope of hay meadow. So I had the ranch manager ask him to take a transit and go out there and set flags at the proposed water line and then set a second row of flags three feet below the proposed water line. And so the mission yesterday was to go look at that and see how much dirt or how much l l brand new lake bottom was going to be less than three feet deep. And of that newly covered ground, over 80% of that was going to be less than three feet deep. So as I talked to the landowner today, just before this show, I was explaining to him, hey, what I think you need to do is let's give up some of that size or surface area Build that dirt up by going down and re reconfigure the shoreline. Make it more serpentine, like a snake moves. 
So if we have, if we can take that 15 acres or 20 acres, whatever that is, haven't measured it, of that piece of the oxbow that he wants to make a good fishing lake, the mission is to create shoreline, more shoreline. If we can create more shoreline, then we can create more areas to fish and we can improve the productivity of the lake to grow more fish. So what I told him was, go ahead, he's anxious, he's ready to go. So I said, job one is you go look at those two flag lines and you see what I'm talking about. And there's one area where there's about three acres where the water's gonna be less than three feet deep. I said, get your dozer guy in there or the scraper guy, get all the topsoil off of that and let's prepare that for a spoils area where we can take some dirt, excavate, move that dirt up into where it's gonna to be too shallow, raise, the, raise the, the shoreline, give up some surface area. You don't have to move as much dirt to get to that three feet deep as fast as possible. And then take the shoreline and make it a three to one slope down to three feet where we can create some shells for, for spawning beds. And from there, a three to one slope down to six feet deep and just take some of that shoreline and stair step it going down with a three to one slope, shelf, three to one slope, down to six feet, and a shelf. Then we'll come back and accessorize it and add some structure. He's planning on flooding a few trees, which he doesn't have many. And I told him, you know what, if you decide you wanna flood those trees by keeping that water line where it's, where it's marked, then we'll take those trees, pull them out. They're all hackberry trees, honey locust, and other stuff, and we'll turn those into fish structure. Hey, Elena, she says, hey, Mr. Baba, I was wondering why some of our bluegill have copper bellies, but most of them have yellow bellies. Thank you, Elena. Well, the ones that have the copper bellies, I tell you what, you, got, you girls do this. Miranda and Elena, you guys, when you catch some of those bluegill, hold them up and look above their lateral line and look at the scales and see if the scales are tipped in black. If they're tipped dark, those are males. And then look at their belly color and compare that to the females. The females don't have that black tip on their scales, or on the outside edge of their scales. And I would just about bet you that the, 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 the most common answer I can give on that is different strains of bluegills have different color bellies. Copper-nosed bluegill tend to have a copper on their nose and their fins tend to be kind of a, a copper colored. But their bellies are typically yellow and sometimes they can be a little bit more orange. So some of the bluegills that are native to your part of the country have yellow bellies, but look and see if the color difference is because some are males and some are females. Females of sunfish species are, the females are less colorful than the males. The males are more colorful because that's part of how they do their mating rituals is they use their colors. Drew Schmidt, I have coontail taken over a one acre pond. Any idea how to control it besides cutting and raking? Yes, when you say taking over your pond. Uh, today I went and treated a 20 something acre lake with fluoridone, but that stuff's pretty expensive. Now what you can do with coontail is you can spot treat that with some herbicides. Here, here's what I'm gonna tell everybody that's got aquatic plant problems this time of year. Go to Google Aqua Plant after the show. And it, if you wanna find it, it's aquaplant.tamu.edu. And you can look your plants up and identify them. Job one is to a properly identify the plant. And then you can click on a link that will take you to the different treatment options. And once you see those treatment options, then you can figure out what would work the best. I mean, I've used grass carp, I've used aquathol, I've used fluoridone, I've spot treated it, I've treated it wholesale to take out all of it. It just kind of depends on your goals. Let's see, I wanna go back to that one question. Okay, Colin Owen says, how many pounds of fish per acre of water? It depends on the species of fish. Like for example, the majority of public lakes in the United States have common carp. It's not uncommon for common carp to compose about 200 pounds per acre. Where in that same lake, largemouth bass might compose 40 to 50 pounds per acre where bluegill production would compose maybe 150 to 200 pounds per acre, but never be that much at one time. And what I mean by that is when bluegill spawn, a lot of times they get eaten quickly, but they still count as production, you know? So standing crop of bluegill may be 75 to 100 pounds at any given time. Bass might be 40 to 50 pounds at any given time. 
where in private waters that are properly managed, bass may be anywhere from 50 to 80 pounds per acre on unfed, on unfed lakes. So it, it varies based on species. Colin, what does it take to get the boss to tour a bunch of ponds in Utah? A check, an airplane ticket and consulting fee, and I'll fall in love with you in a minute. No, really, I mean, I do, that's part of how I make my living is I go consult and help people with lakes and ponds. So uh, send me a message and we'll, we'll start the conversation. Okay, let's see, Stephen Martin, he knows the drill. Hey, you know what's after seven? I'm gonna take a minute. Hey, Mike Fornash, I see your question. I'll get to it. I see James Allen. Hey, you guys know the deal here. Palm Boss Magazine, 35 bucks a year. Cheaper than a Friday night day and it lasts a year. And that date's over like soon. I know Josie's watching tonight and I'm not sure if her hubby's with her, but if he's not, he's at the fire station being a volunteer firefighter. I love that. So uh, anyway, 35 bucks a year. Josie will testify, testify that this is $35 well spent because I promise you, Every issue, you're going to get a nugget that you can use and help prevent paying the dumb tax. Speaking of the dumb tax, pondboss.teachable.com. I've got the Pond Boss Institute of Higher Pondology up there for sale and guarantee you to help you not pay as much dumb tax. I can't, I can't prevent anybody from paying dumb tax. Hell, I pay dumb tax. I paid some today, you know, with contract work out there that, that's getting done on our place. And so, you know, but with, with this Institute of Higher Pondology, I can help you minimize that dumb tax. I also want to do a shout out to Purina Mills. I always talk about them because they sponsor this show. They help. And you know what? And I don't even care that they sponsor. I do, but I don't really care that they sponsor the show. What I care about is how interested they are in making sure we have good products. Now, it's never easy, but it's always right. You know. So I've grown some giant fish, feeding fish, Purina Aquamax MVP 500, 600. Those are the big, the big three feeds. If you're feeding hybrid stripers or feed trained bass, uh, 600 is a good feed. There's other feeds in the lineup, but Aquamax 500 has smaller pellets to feed smaller fish. 600 is bigger pellets, probably three eighths of an inch. And the MVP is a mix of nine different pellet sizes to feed air fish from that big up to you know so big. Uh, Texas Hunter Products also sponsor this show. Uh, I, I sent an email to Chris a couple of weeks ago. I had a lid blow off of one of my feeders up at the office ponds, and I needed a battery and a timer. I had them the next day, the next day. So thank you to those. Easy Doc, David Schneiderman, he and I had a little back-and-forth conversation about his muddy water. I popped into the office, noticed he brought three jugs of muddy water so that Justin can figure out how much gypsum he's going to need to clear his muddy pond up. Mike Fornash, what are your thoughts on a three acre pond, three years old with continuous algae issues? We checked the water with Sechi this week, 30 inch clarity. What would you do in Southeast Iowa? <clears throat> three acre pond, three years old. I probably wouldn't worry about it because you're not fishing that pond yet. Now here, here what I would, what I would tell you with continuous algae issues Continuous to me means that once the temperature window opens for algae, it grows, it dies, more grows, it dies, more grows, and it's a kind of an ongoing continual issue. You can break up that life cycle with a chelated copper-based algae side that you can buy over the counter at all the farm stores, even Tractor Supply. Your Purina dealer has products on an end cap or, or in some shelf space. And just be sure that you identify the plant. If it's filamentous algae, you can take it out with, with an algae site. Now, here's the problem. You guys that watch this show, and, and I, 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 I know the, the ladies have this memorized. You guys, sometimes it goes in one ear and right out the other. But plants need three things to grow. It needs food, sunlight, and temperature. When those three things come together, something's going to grow. So... When you, when you have algae and you treat it with an algae side, you're going to kill it, but that doesn't mean it won't come back in two or three weeks. It's kind of like mowing the grass. As long as those three things, the big three things are right there, it's going to grow. Something's going to grow. It may not be algae the second time around, but the problem is not the algae. The problem is all the circumstances coming together to allow it to grow. But you can take it out with an algae side. It doesn't cost a whole lot. 
Now, what I don't know, what I don't know about um, uh, Iowa, Southeast Iowa, is whether tilapia are legal or not. I know they're not in Missouri, they're not in Illinois, but I do not know about Iowa. Tilapia will eat filamentous algae. We use them in Texas every year. Look at there, Jim Allen is telling Mike Foran or Drew Schmidt uh, about what they've done. So here's the skinny on grass carp. <clears throat> They used, they used grass carp. They ate the coontail, but the coontail was replaced by milfoil. Actually, e e each year a different weed disappeared until the milfoil is 98% of all weeds. Need to know the entire menu before using grass carp. Now, grass carp will eat milfoil, and they, they prefer it about the same amount as coontail. Coontail is a little bit hard for them to eat, but I've used grass carp to control coontail before. Now, if the grass carp can, can gain control you know, and, and, and there's a little balancing act here. I, I don't like to overstock grass carp. I like to start low, like at two or three per acre. And if if that pond is overwhelmed by coontail or overwhelmed by any plant, it didn't happen in one year. It happened over a span of time, two years, three years, four years. You know, so it's not fair to that pond to get rid of it all at once with too many grass carp because then you trade problems. But what you can do is kind of a multi-pronged system protocol where you can go in and take out some of the algae, I mean, some of the coontail with uh, aquathol or go to aquaplant, look at your options. Reward, I think, is one of them. And you can go look at these different herbicides and pick the one that's most appropriate for your use based on your pond usage. You know, so if you can thin it out by and, and do that by not overstocking the grass carp, give the crop, grass carp some time to, to gain some control, then they won't eradicate it too fast. <coughs> Kirk Swallow, I put in 56 to 8 inch tiger bass in my pond in November. Do you think they had a spawn this year? Uh, Kirk, I'll tell you this. If you have, if you stock 56 to 8 inch tiger bass in November in South Louisiana, where you live, I would expect out of those 50, half of them are boys, half of them are girls. 25 boys, 25 girls. Of those girls, eight of them have what it takes to grow really fast, get really big. Those eight coming into the year, if they made it to nine or 10 inches this spring, they absolutely could spawn. And I've, I've seen stranger things, but I'm gonna tell you, Six or eight of those bass probably had the opportunity to spawn. Some of them probably did. I wouldn't be surprised if you've got some baby bass swimming around out there. And if you built the food chain like you're supposed to, and I think you did, then that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Colin Owens have a game fish pond, largemouth bass, bluegill, catfish, and wipers. Okay. That's pretty cool. Haven't been to Utah in a long time. Look at there, here comes Jared Poole, Hill Country Hammer Guys and Outfitters. I'm gonna to get to spend some time with Jared next week. He gave me a call here a few days ago. I've been meaning to call him and I just haven't done it. And then I got to digging for his phone number and I didn't have it. So I'm so thankful that, that he rang me, but I didn't have a chance to message him. But we're gonna spend a little time. He does, he does a, if you guys wanna go catch some really big bass during big bass season, he's the guy. He's caught, I don't know, he, you put it up there here in a minute, uh, Jared. Tell how many people or how many big bass, ten pound plus, that you guys caught and released. I don't think you, I don't think they put any of them in the Cheryl Lunker program. It's catch it, take a picture, release it right there, which I'll, I respect that. Why? I should know the answer to this, but should I be only running my aeration at night? Um, you know what? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, oh, now we're we're. Um, where Wyatt's place is, is near Abilene. Now it was 103 there today, but there's a front coming, rain is predicted, and the temperature's gonna get into the 50s with highs in the 70s. That's a great time to keep it running. When you need to put your aeration on a timer, is if you have a thermometer, you be checking your temperature when you're at your place. And once that temperature reaches 83 degrees on the way up, top to bottom, that's when you put your aeration system on a timer and run it from nine at night till nine in the morning. And if you will do that, you'll keep that ambient temperature down below the, the lethal levels. 
In the next issue of Pond Boss, there's going to be an article by Dr. Wes Neal that talks about the effect of temperature on largemouth bass. And it's frightening. At 87 degrees, they start to die. I've witnessed that. That's part of how I came up with the recommendation. Let's put, let's put these aeration systems on a timer in the hot part of the country, you know, the south, southeast, and the southwest. When it gets hot, change your timer. It's, it's more important to get the temperature down than it is to allow the, the water 24 hour a day access to the atmosphere to relieve itself of gases and absorb more gases. That's more important. Look at there, Jared, 31 bass over 10 pounds for clients this year. Biggest th three over 13 pounds, biggest 14.8. That's huge. That's so good. Okay, let me see. Troy Todd, how many pounds of tilapia per acre do you recommend for algae control? 20 pounds. I see 20 pounds is, is you know what? Actually, you can do as little as 10 pounds, but if you've got bass in there, stock 20 pounds per acre. And what that does is when those tilapia start having babies, the babies feed on the algae, and then the babies turn around and become food for like small bluegill and tiny bass and things like that. So they become part of the food chain. And so you want enough young of the year to survive long enough that they can graze on that algae and control it. And kind of um, the trial and error numbers that I've, I've learned is 20 pounds per acre into a lake that has bass and bluegill in it already. Uh-oh, let me see here, I did something wrong. Oh, there it is. Okay, Josie, I spent a lot of time at SLC. Had a launch there, Troy Todd, Indiana. Okay, let's see, Troy. I already forgot what the question was. Let me go back, look at this. I'm missing it somewhere. Troy Todd's from Indiana. Maybe I missed the comment. Okay, let me see here. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, oh, I see what it is. Justin Lugwood was asking him. How many pounds tilapia? Yeah, okay, I got it, yeah. 20 pounds per acre. Okay, uh, Justin Lugwood, Essop, who is uh, Scott Schilling, he lives in northern Indiana. He recommends 40 pounds per acre. Um, he's probably in a bigger hurry. Stephen Martin, tiger bass. Never heard of that one in Kansas. Here's what a tiger bass is. A tiger bass is a trademark brand name from American Sport Fish Hatchery that's been in existence probably 20 something, 20 years, I bet, maybe more. And what it is, is, is the, uh, the guys that started American Sport Fish Hatchery, one of, their, one of their deals was that they wanted to take the very, very best Florida strain largemouth bass and cross them with the very, very best, fastest growing, biggest growing northern largemouth bass and cross those. So they started accumulating brood stock and, and identifying, making sure the genetic integrity was there and they tagged each fish. And they started crossing these fish with each other. And over a period of six or seven years, they started to develop this strain with these certain crosses with fish of certain characteristics. And, they, and, and the bottom line was they, they carried hybrid vigor into those young of the year. And they just trade named it Tiger Bass. So they're, they're an F1 intergrade cross between high powered northern largemouth bass, big, fast growing uh, Florida strain largemouth bass, and the offsprings are F1s. And they're called, trademark name is Tiger Bass. Okay, Troy's ordered 25 pounds per acre. That didn't take long. <laughs> Danny Mack. Danny Mack is, he's truly a rocket scientist. He's an engineer guy. I mean, his, his wheels are always spinning. It's one of my favorite things about Danny Mack from San Antonio. He's always thinking, creating, you know, this engineering mind that he's got. He develops things. Well, he put an air temperature controller in the line with the power to his aerator. So his aeration system is set to shut off when the air is over 80 degrees. He, he, he's talking about he may need to raise that during the summer to get enough aeration. And, you know, part of the way you decide that is how much biomass are you carrying and is there enough water being moved that it communicates with the atmosphere to be able to do what it does, you know, with, with the magic steam of water to cleanse itself by contacting that 
that air. So, pretty cool stuff. All right, anybody got any more questions, throw them at me. 720, we got about 10 minutes before we shut her on down. Hit me some more questions. But I'm going to circle back and talk uh, a, a little bit about what Trey and Steve and I were talking about last night. We were sharing some stories of different places that we'd been. And one of those places was the Wagner Ranch, which uh, was, in a, was in a trust for 99 years. That trust expired in the late 90s, and the heirs began to fight. It's 530,000-acre ranch. It's the largest privately owned contiguous piece of property in Texas. It's not the biggest ranch in Texas, but it's the largest contiguous piece of property. And Stan Kroenke bought it of Walmart money and the guy that owns the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Anyway, we had... Uh, Trey has spent time there as a wildlife biologist for the Texas Parks and Wildlife. Steve had been there because he was invited to hunt and fish and then get story ideas and, and share some experiences there. And I got to go help stock the ponds and lakes. You know, and the thing that fascinated me with a ranch that size, there's just no doubt in my mind that there's some areas of that ranch where a human foot is never touched. It's just too rugged out there. Uh, there was when I was going there in in, in its heyday of management back then it was the late eighties, early nineties, and I was there a lot back then. The uh, they had one wheat field that was twenty thousand acres, and they had to deal with John Deere, where John Deere would set up a test facility, provide the tractors and the equipment. The Wagner Ranch would pay something, and then at the end, John Deere would buy the equipment back and then break it down and look at the wear and tear and figure out how to better engineer their stuff, but that one 20,000 acre wheat field wasn't cross fenced back then, and it took one tractor eight hours to go around at one time, just to kind of give you a scope. And, it, you know, cattle ranch, they had oil production, although they didn't own any wells, they got paid a royalty for what was, what was harvested from the oil field, and then they had farming stuff there. But, a number I got to learn a number of things there. And matter of fact, that ranch is one of the places where I got to understand and begin to really wrap my brain around that conditioning thing about largemouth bass. And here's how that happened. And I've told this story on the show, but I didn't identify the ranch. But there, uh, there was a guy down around Columbus, Texas, that wanted to build a lake. And I've told this story before. He says, you know, don't worry about the mule going blind, load the wagon. You guys that watch the show all the time remember that. So, uh, anyway, he wanted to buy some fish from the ranch. And the ranch has got over 500 ponds and lakes, most of which they'll never fish. And a bunch of those ponds had extra fish. So the game warden back then said, you know what? And he, he had the bulldozer guy build him a couple of small storage hatchery ponds where he could pump water in them. And, and I built him an electrofishing boat. So they took that electrofishing boat and he would go harvest fish and stockpile them into these smaller ponds and then sell them for stocking lakes back then. Well, this guy down around Columbus wanted to buy $25,000 worth of fish, but he wanted two double-digit bass. Game warden says, we're not selling any double-digit bass. Well, this guy was in his 70s and I told him, hey, they've got some, but they're not going to sell them. He says, money whip them. I'd never heard that before. So I called the game warden. I said, hey, this guy wants to buy $25,000 worth of bass, but he wants two double-digit bass. He said, I've already told you, not going to sell them. I said, well, let me ask you this. Would you take 200 bucks? Now, this is in the, in the, in the like, 1992, okay? This is long, 30 years ago. So he says, no, I'm not taking 200 bucks for a double-digit bass. I said, would you take 500? And he paused. I thought, oh, my gosh. We got the principle established. Now we just got to get to the price. He said, would that guy pay 500 bucks a piece for a double-digit bass? I said, yeah, he would. He said, he wants two of them? I said, yeah. He said, well, I've got this old muddy pond over there that I've shocked, and I've, every time I shock it, I shock up two double-digit bass. Now, this pond, I'd been with him before, and it probably covered eight acres, and it was pretty shallow, and I promise you, we would shock up two or three double-digit bass in that one little hole. 
but you couldn't see six inches in that water and it looked like red chocolate milk. And when you picked those bass up, they were snow white, but they were huge. Now there's no way they could see to eat. Those fish figured out how to make a living with their lateral lines, noise, because I mean, there was abundant numbers of bluegill and gizzard shad in it. And that's how they made a living, it was in muddy water, not seeing, being able to sense by movement and feeding. So he went over there, I went over there with him and we shocked up one bass, it was 12 and a half and one bass, it was right at 11. Put him on my truck, went over, sane his hatchery ponds and got some bass, hauled them down to Columbus, Texas, put him in a nine acre lake. This is where the conditioning thing comes in. And so we stocked him, he, the guy never caught him. The only time he saw him was when we stocked him and then two years back to back when we shocked him. One year later, we put the electric fishing boat in there, shocked up both of them. The 12 and a half pound bass had grown to 11 and the 10 pound bass had grown to eight. The next year we shocked, that 12 and a half pound bass that had grown to 11 was now nine and the other one, we didn't get it. I don't know if it had died. We, we just didn't get it. And I tried to find because I kind of knew where it was going to be based on the structure. Well, that's the scenario that started me thinking about this conditioning thing. You know, and so I started paying more attention to that. And over the years, I have seen that trend where if you take fish that grow up in that environment, move them to that environment, the odds are high that they won't thrive. The odds are high that they're going to decline. At least 50% are going to decline. S some of the others are going to be right at average, maybe get a little bit better. And then there's going to be a handful that can really adjust to that environment by plasticity and reconfiguring their conditioning. So that's about all I got to say about that. <laughs> Trey Carpenter, he worked, Trey worked for Texas Parks and Wildlife. Yes, I might point out that the game warden worked for the ranch. Yes, he did. That's very important. I, I didn't even think about that. But that ranch was so big, when in with the oil field, they had you know oil field workers that, that began to have a little ownership, they thought, and they'd go on their route at lunch, they'd go fish some of the ponds. So the game warden's job was to patrol the ranch as a private game warden. Now, the, all the game wardens that I ever met there were former Parks and Wildlife Department game wardens, either retired or quit that job to go get this job. But yes, private sector game wardens. That's the, that's the deal. <laughs> okay, Billy Bates, let's see here. Here's a question. Is there anything better than feeding your growing bluegill in a pond? I don't think so. You know what? The thing I love about feeding them is not only are they going to get bigger, but you can see them. You know, of course... Everybody that watches this show knows I talk about happy water, habitat, food chain, genetics, and harvest. If you don't pay attention to all those things, if you don't harvest, then your happy water goes to heck in a handbasket. So, yes, I do love that. Um, Nick Owens, Bob, any hard size limits on pond acreage in southeast Texas before state or local government needs to be involved? Still in the trying to figure out how big a I would like to go stage in searching property. Uh, you know... There, the, here's what you're asking about permitting issues, I think. So, on the at 30,000 feet, there's the federal government. If you're going to impound more than 200 acre feet, then you have to work through the Corps of Engineers and get that permit. Now, I'm not telling you everybody does that. Some guys roll the dice. I don't like that because it makes me nervous, makes me think, you know, if I work with these guys that, and I don't tell them that their odds of getting busted are, are there. You know, I'm not doing my job. So I tell them that. But for the most part, most guys will go in, but you got to hire an engineer. You know, you got to come up with the plans, apply for a permit, and it takes at least 18 months to get that permit. Now, there's also TCEQ permits, and there's also local permits. There might be county, there might be water district permits. Sometimes there you got to get permission from FEMA if you're going to build a lake in a floodplain. You know, and so it's, it's kind of a convoluted, complicated process, but start locally in that area and see if there are any local permitting issues. You know, now the thing I love about Texas is we're, Texas is pretty forgiving and understanding the value of impounded water. 
There's over 1.3 million private lakes and ponds just in Texas. When I started in business back in 1980, the NRCS Soil Conservation Service back then estimated 750,000. And I expect that that number to be doubled within another three or four years because there's so many ponds and lakes being built. So, hey, you know what? This hour always flies by. Trey, I enjoyed hanging out with you and Steve. Josie, good to talk to you. Elena, get your homework done, honey, which I know you did. You know, and Danny Max, always good to, to share a toast. And uh, Nick, Troy Todd, you know, Billy Bates, everybody that comes and joins this show. Trey, glad you're here tonight. Uh, Stephen Martin, asking about Tiger Bass. I love these questions. I really appreciate everybody coming on and watching this show. It kind of helps my 67-year-old brain keep moving and keep active, and I love hanging out with you. So I'm not sure where I'll be next Wednesday. Yes, I am. Yes, I do. I'll be traveling somewhere. I forget where, but I got to go somewhere. So anyway, what? What, baby? Oh, I'll be picking up the shocker boat Wednesday. Oh, yeah. Cause, oh, I know what. I'm headed down to teach a class. So let me figure out where I'm going to be, and I'll post something or get Leanne to post something on the Palm Boss Facebook page in the next few days. So until I see you again, thanks for joining in. Adios.